Um, so yes, my name is Tom. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm here today to talk about one of my favorite CSS properties, uh, and that's the transform. The transform allows you to do some incredible and engaging things inside of the browser very simply. Um, and because of that, it's, it's just this very powerful feature and can often be abused. So my goal here today is to show you some pretty cool techniques that you can use to do more advanced transforms beyond the basic you know, card flip that we often see. Um, but to also provide some guidelines as to when we should be using transforms. So one of the, the biggest benefits that we can see and pass on even to our users is simplicity. Uh, and that comes in two senses. One, it, it makes our lives simpler as, as authors, but it also makes life simpler for the user because we can offer simplified UI to make uh, the end user actually um, happier. Uh, so this is a color picker that I I created for a mobile application that basically changes the hue and lightness um, inside of a room. Uh, so you go in and within uh, one UI, basically I want it to be able to set the hue, right? So as you rotate this kind of device around, it changes the hue based on where you're at. Um, and you can scale it in and out to change the overall brightness of the lights inside the room. Um, so it creates this really simple within one gesture of my thumb, I can shut the lights off, turn them on, change the colors. Um, and this is easily done with CSS transforms. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of this math because this isn't .js, but um, this is basically just requires a little bit of, you know, we're using ATAN2, figuring out where the mouse coordinate actually is, multiplying by 180, dividing by pi, all this kind of math that we probably learned somewhere along the way and totally forgot, um, at least I do. Um, distance calculations and a few other things. And basically figuring out, you know, how, how much have we rotated this, let's set our transform to that, and then also use that same angle as a hue, saturation, and lightness value so that we can change the color as well. So this is the typical, when you start moving into 3D space, this is like the basic tutorial that you usually see, like, hey, I made a 3D cube. Um, this is not at all practical, I don't know why you need 3D cubes on the web, but let's assume that you do, right? This is so easy to do with CSS because you just pass in two different functions. We pass in a rotate, we pass in a translate, we do it a few different ways and we can generate this three-dimensional object. Now, I come from, I used to do, I, I'm worried that everybody's gonna boo me, but I used to do a lot of flash work, actually. Um, and doing 3D and flash, yes, thank you. Um, doing 3D and flash was actually kind of a pain in the ass because you had to pull in a library like Paper Vision, you had to set up renderers, you had to do a lot of work just to get a simple shape on there. But with CSS, it's one line and it's, you just start working in 3D space. Everything else is already there for you. So we can kind of use the same principle to start modeling other primitives, right? We can build cylinders using the exact same principle, just with different values. And we can kind of hack the background property to act as our um, texture mapping, right? So we can add a background image on here. We can build a little SAS loop to basically offset that background and now we've created this whole 3D object. Now more complex 3D modeling requires polygons, basically. My favorite way of doing this is with an SVG mask. So we can set that on there. It's still just a div, right? But it has a mask on it that makes it look like a polygon. And we can put a lot of these together to start doing more complex 3D models. Um, now what this, what this hits on though is this concept that the more complex you get with your CSS, and it's specifically your transforms, right? The practicality of the solution starts to go down this hill. Um, because doing this crane took a lot of work. I could have really learned how to do the actual origami in the time it took to set all these transforms up manually. So the second benefit that we start to see from transforms, and this is a pretty big one, is speed. Um, we can pass on much better performance to the end user. Uh, and we've probably all heard, you know, transforms, we kind of come along with uh, this idea of hardware acceleration. But let's take a look at what this actually means for us. So I've got an iPhone that I'm just moving, I don't know if you can see it up here, it's just moving about 20 pixels left and right. Now the top half of this iPhone though is being animated with the left property. It's moving from zero to 20. The bottom half of it is using the translate function. And it looks pretty much the same from here. But if you actually zoom in on this, you'll notice that there's actually a pretty big difference. You'll see that this top one is kind of snapping as it moves across. It's more of a step animation than a nice clean tween. And that's because the left property is like trying to preserve the pixel grid. So as it moves this thing, it only goes on each pixel value. There's no interpolation of sub-pixel values. So you get this kind of jerky animation. 
whereas the bottom interpolates every single frame and calculates, okay, this is exactly how this element needs to be um, rendered on the actual screen. Now, it would sound like the bottom is actually doing a lot more work than the top, um, but as it turns out, it's actually much more performant. Uh, so at the top, you'll see here all these little green bars. That's a paint process that the browser has gone through on the CPU, and there's a ton of them. Um, but on the bottom, the transform, there's very few green bars. That's a good thing, uh, because what has happened here is the browser has basically promoted that layer up to the GPU's compositor, and it's going to figure all that stuff out there, which is a lot more performant than on the CPU. So we have a lot of room to do other stuff here. Um, and we're hitting our 60 frames per second. And the interesting thing is it seems that even when you're animating using the left property, even though it's pixel snapping, all those like, little sub-pixel values that it should be interpolating but doesn't, it's still causing another repaint. So it's doing a lot of work that you don't need to do at all. So let's talk about a little more complex kind of animation. Um, and this hits on one of the problems that, that I have with the transform property. Um, if I want to build a simple particle system, it's pretty easy to just animate a particle. Right here I've created some keyframes and I'm just moving this particle up. But if I want that particle to kind of wobble as it goes up in the air, uh, kind of like in a sine wave, it's much more difficult to actually achieve this. I can add a keyframe and kind of shift it over to the left, but it's still this really rigid, um, non-fluid kind of animation. And that's because I need two different timing functions, and the transform property does not allow you to do this. Um, and that's, that's kind of a, a large hurdle, and the only way around it really is by adding more DOM. So we can get around this by adding a pseudo element here, promoting all the paint properties up to that pseudo element, and giving it its own animation. Um, and here we have a flame wobble animation, so the particle itself just moves up. And then the, the uh, pseudo element inside of it just moves left and right and uses an ease in out instead. And you put them together and you get this nice sine wave. It's unfortunate we have to add more DOM, but it, it is possible. So we can put a lot of these together and create this as kind of like a fire. If we use a new mixed blend mode, like now it's really burning good, right? Um, and we get fairly good frame rates here. Um, we're still at about 60 frames per second. There's maybe 100 particles there. That's, that's pretty good. Um, but again, we're starting to get down that curve of, of practical. Um, we might be better off using some other technology here. And so the last benefit, the last reason to use transforms um, is for seduction. And this is basically to uh, seduce the end user into feeling like some sort of emotion. Um, and this is probably a little, um, it's very subjective as to what you're doing. Uh, and it's easy to make the case, well, it's just all about the content. I don't need any fancy stuff going on. Uh, but I would, I would make the argument that sometimes the content is actually the experience that people have. And if you can give them something really unique and engaging, um, you've done something pretty, pretty amazing. And I think one company that does this really well is Apple. Um, if you've played around with the new Apple TV, they've got this little controller that you can kind of uh, move to each one of these poster elements in the interface and kind of wiggle them around. And it's got a little lighting effect, right? And there's a little bit of a parallax effect there as well. Um, and it's just a little bit of fun. It's a little bit of like seducing me each time I use it. I've had Apple TV for at least a month now and like I still wiggle all the little frames in Netflix. Can't help it. Um, and we can achieve this using transforms and CSS as well. So if we bust this open, we see there's basically five layers involved here. The bottom three layers just have different background images. So uh, there's that. We've got Walt on that frame, the transparent PG. We've got Jesse on this one. Uh, and then we have two, two lights here. Um, they're both radial gradients, but they just have slightly different blend modes, and that helps get the real kind of realistic lighting that we're going after there. So then what we need to do is we need to actually add that kind of parallaxy effect to it. Um, my first instinct in doing this was to just use translate Z and kind of offset them both, you know, roughly 50 pixels. And this does create the effect that we want when we wobble this around. Um, but you'll see that, you know, Walt and Jesse's legs are kind of sticking out at the bottom here, and that's not what we want. So intuitively, I would just say, okay, we say overflow hidden, and it should clip everything off there. This completely destroys your three-dimensional space, and this is one of the gotchas here. So, if you use overflow hidden or you use a mask, it's gonna completely flatten out your Z space. Even if you say transform style preserve 3D, which would typically preserve all those 3D 
um, layers inside of an element, it still flattens it out. So that's, that's kind of a bummer. And the way we get around that is by manually setting the x and the y uh, translates by themselves as we move this around. And they're slightly off, so it gives it that effect of actually having a z space when they're it's not actually there. So we want to add lights now. But when we do this, we've got those two layers, they've got mixed blend modes, and suddenly it just busted out of the overflow again. Um, and not only that, if we look down, we've got a whole bunch of green bars again. Uh, this is unfortunate. Um, it seems to have trumped our overflow and caused you know, lower performance, which is not great. But luckily, we're getting this new CSS property, uh, the will change property, where we can specify, hey, look, ahead of time, I want you to know that I'm going to be transforming these layers. And so for each of the five layers inside of this poster, we can say, will change transform. And that lets the browser know, OK, I'm going to move this off to the compositor, and we're going to treat these layers a little bit differently. We're going to do more work ahead of time, but during runtime, it's going to run much smoother for you. And you can see when you, when you look at this, those green bars are pretty much gone, and we're getting a much better frame rate. So we're getting a nice 60 frames per second, kind of buttery smooth experience here. So I'm very excited about, about that property. So a couple years ago, I was, I, was a little, I was a little frustrated as I was working with some of the new uh, 3D space kind of things. And I realized that you know, everything appears really flat when you're using just normal CSS. And it's because we don't have a concept of a lighting engine um, for CSS. You know, as I move this around, everything's being painted exactly the same color. And so you can't really see where one shape ends and one shape begins. So I built a, a lighting engine called Photon that is a real-time rendering engine that throws um, another element inside of each face and either tints it or shades it based on its orientation to the light. So to simplify this, basically, we have a, we have a plane that's pointing towards a light that we can set. Um, and depending on how it's oriented, if it's pointing right at the light, it's nice and bright. And if it's pointed away, it shades it a little bit more. This was a fun, I shouldn't say fun. It was, it was an interesting experiment um, into the kind of workings of what's actually going on here. Um, my intuition said, OK, well, we'll just pull off the, trans, uh, the transforms that are currently on this plane. And we'll use those to kind of figure out how it looks uh, coordinated towards the light. Now, the problem is, is when you go to get the computed style, for one of these planes, it comes back not as those nice, neat functions, but as a matrix 3D string. Um, and this is basically the browser's rep representation of any possible transform that you're putting on an element. It puts it into this matrix. Matrix math is confusing, uh, and it's pretty cumbersome to actually work with. What you have to do is you have to decompose this matrix to pull out the values that you actually need here, which are the rotation values. And I, again, I'm not going to go through all of this because it would take up all of my time and probably bore the hell out of you. Um, but you can basically see in here there's a ton of vector math going on in here that's calculating all these different dot products. And it's a very like, delicate process of moving from one property, extracting the values, moving on to the next, extracting those values. And it's very, very complex. There's a lot of computations going on just to get the rotations that are on that. We're almost there. All right. Then, once you have those rotations, you also have to convert that into a vector. And you have to pull the light's vector as well. A vector is basically um, a point space that has a magnitude pointing out towards some other, some other point in space. Um, and what you have to do is pull those different vectors and figure out how they relate to each other. Now, if you have a parent element that also has some transforms on it, you have to do that whole process again for the parents, because the parents affect the children. So this is a very complex and cumbersome operation here. Um, then you can finally calculate the angle's difference. And that's, that's the key. And you can use that difference, give it different percentage values, and shade or tint elements based on that. So this was a lot of work. I don't know exactly how practical this is. I've not used it in production, but it was a great learning experience for me. But it, it does kind of hit on that point of once you hit a certain level of complexity with this, it starts to go downhill. The, practical, uh, the practicality of it really kind of hits, hits a bottom. Um, so this is kind of how I see it, right? Um, and 
I think it's on us to try to understand, like, just because we can do something with CSS transforms doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best solution. I've fallen into that trap, like, oh, I just really want to figure this out. Um, but there's probably other technologies that make a lot more sense once you start hitting a certain limit. Maybe it's, maybe it's about here, 60, 70 percent. Man, it's, it's much more practical to, to move it over to WebGL or something. So, Use transforms to make something simpler, both for you and your user. Uh, use them to make it fast for your user. Doing uh, 60 frame per second animations, um, and just make it awesome, and kind of seduce your user a little bit. Um, thank you.